Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, tonight for the 2023 Fall Speaker Series through the American Tapestry Alliance. Uh, we're thrilled to have you joining us here today. Um, and I want to take a moment to introduce our wonderful speaker here. We're lucky to be joined by Simone Elizabeth Saunders. Uh, Simone Elizabeth Saunders is a textile artist based in Wilkinsis, Calgary, Canada. She holds a BFA with distinction from the Alberta University of the Arts, received in 2020. Her textiles are hand tufted in the medium of rug making using a punch needle and tufting machine. Saunders explores themes of the diaspora, ancestorship, and Black womanhood. Her colorful textiles highlight motifs and iconography from her Jamaican heritage and engage with socio-cultural factors reclaiming power from oppressive ideologies. Saunders has a career in theater arts, a previous BFA from the University of Alberta's Acting Conservatory, weaving uh, her theater experiences and integrating dramatism and storytelling within her creations. Simone uplifts narratives of Black joy, and resilience. Simone recently received the 2023 Calgary Black Achievement Award in Arts, Media, and Entertainment. She was named one of the top 20 compelling Calgarians for 2022 and top 40 under 40 of Calgarian professionals by Avenue Magazine. Simone was awarded the national winner for the Bank of Montreal's first art competition in 2020. She has been internationally featured uh, select media credits include Black Art Magazine from the United States, Studio Magazine from the United States, Create Magazine from the United States, Canada's House and Home Magazine, CBC Arts, CBQ, CBCQ, Studio Magazine, Boom, Uppercase Magazine, Love Embroidery, Pom Pom Magazine, Textile Plus, Fair Lady, Surface Design Journal, Colossal, and Design Milk. Recent exhibitions include the Textile Museum of Canada, Contemporary Calgary, the Minneapolis Art Institute in Minnesota, the Mint Museum in North Carolina, and the Arts Westchester, New York. Saunders has been collected by international museums and prominent collectors. Simone's debut international solo exhibition, Unearthing Unicorns, debuted this past spring at Claire Oliver Gallery in Harlem, New York. Her most recent work will be showcased at Miami Art Week with Claire Oliver Gallery. Simone Elizabeth Saunders is represented by Claire Oliver Gallery in New York. We will uh, first enjoy Simone's presentation and then there will be time for a Q&A following the presentation. Please join me in welcoming Simone Elizabeth Saunders. Thank you so much, John Paul. Can you hear me okay? Want to yes, make sure perfect. that Thank you. Perfect. Got the okay. Um, welcome to my studio in Mokinstis. Just as Ch uh, John Paul had noted, um, I'm located in Calgary in Canada. And, you know, I have been and am really looking forward to sharing my practice with you all. So thank you so much for joining me, um, engaging with me this evening, this beautiful fall evening. You might see the light trickling in behind me. Um, and to have this in sync uh, through the American Tapestry Alliance and with New York Textile Month. Um, so as John Paul noted, I create hand tufted textiles, all portraiture with a tufting machine and a punch needle. I've been practicing in this medium since 2019. And this is a very interesting talk for me because you know I'm aware that all of you are very knowledgeable in your respective textiles. And I'm pretty sure that some of you out there um, have some experience with the punch needle or know of the punch needle. So what drew me to this medium? In art school from 2016 to 2020, when I experienced going back to school again, um, I studied textiles, exploring silk screen, dyeing, weaving, on a four harness loom and even experience on a jacquard, which I was completely mesmerized with the weaving. At the same time, I was equally in love with printmaking and drawing. So when I came across the tufting machine, I knew I had to try it because it, it marries my admiration for both drawing and weaving in tandem. 
Uh, this work that you see here is called Worthy, and it is now a part of the permanent collection at the Weissman Museum in Minnesota. So although Punch Needle, Punch Needle has been around for some time, but some of you might be thinking, what is a tufting gun? So the punch needle that you can see um, on the upper, my right-hand side, um, is the punch needle, which was invented in the late 1800s. The one that you can see showcased here is the Amy Oxford punch needle. It's my weapon of choice. Um, the punch needle grew to popularity in North America within the domestic crafts movement in the 1930s. Now the rug tufting machine um, came to popularity in the 1950s, which was predominantly used as a manufacturing tool to create rugs. Now what drew me to that machine is that it is still used today predominantly as within its utilitarian fashion, still to create rugs. So I took on this tool and I created portraiture, lifting what is dominantly made for the ground, lifting it up. Uh, to be highlighted on the walls, um, beautiful portraits, amplifying black womanhood, joy and resilience. I describe it as painting with threads. So shown here, uh, you can see my loom, my studio where I'm sitting right now. And uh, it's a piece from 2022 called She Reveals. It's a work that's celebrating black womanhood, ancestorship, and of belonging identity. Behind her crouched there, you can see the word truth. So most of my works that I will show you today use both of these tools in tandem, the tufting machine, as well as the punch needle. So recently, very recently, I have adopted using only the punch needle for now, <laughs> the tufting machine weighs approximately four pounds. So as you can imagine, holding this tool for many hours was very taxing on my wrists, my shoulders, my backs, my, my back, my arms. And so my body really considering the perseverance and preservation of my artistic body and wanting longevity in that. Um, it's time for me to nurture a bit of a break. And so the punch needle itself is much more gentle of a tool being the analog version of the tufting machine. And, um, you know, it's really allowed me to slow down because as you can see, the punch needle is hole by hole and um, it's almost quadruple the time it takes with the, with the machine. So I really, I really like nurturing that that's slow and steady. So how the tool works, the machine itself, is that you feed the yarn through the needle and, and it weaves in and out of the fabric, the fabric that you can see there with my drawing illuminated on there. Um, and I work from the back side. So what becomes the front is on the other side. So when considering your drawing, you'll have to mirror the image. So as I keep reiterating, my work uplifts Black narratives, sharing joy and strength, beauty of being a woman of color. And this work is called Cosmos Creation. It shows a goddess of creation at one with the galaxies blooming from the supernova, creating a star that which she's holding from her hand and blasting life into her own universe, that concentration that beauty, her third eye uh, beaming forth. And you can see the florals and the plants and some fauna um, growing from within those beams of light. There are strong themes of social justice within my artwork. These works are called It Matters, one and two. And I'd like to rewind to early 2020 when the pandemic hit with all the closures and all the isolation and there was such a disconnect. I was in my final year in university in art school and it was very tough 
being removed from direct contact with my peers and the instruct instructors and in my graduating year and completing the term, but I kept going. And so when creating this work, I was inspired by a Washington Post article that came out that was highlighting the new mask mandates and how black men in particular were being profiled, stopped or assaulted for wearing masks for protecting themselves against COVID, but they were being wrongfully and racially profiled and accused, perceived as being menacing. So the one with the masked man, um, it matters one, was the national winner in Canada for the Bank of Montreal's extensive first art competition, which happens annually. It was held for hundreds of graduating students across Canada and uh, there were provincial winners and then one national winner. And so I was fortunate to have been the national winner and it granted me a large sum of money and encouragement to keep going just as I graduated. And I just felt this passion surging within me. I had a voice and I was excited to continue to share it. So talking about my voice, I would like to discuss finding my voice. And, you know, as an artist, I think that that's such a personal journey. I believe that in inquiring and putting out in the world what you think would others be interested in is truly hindering what I believe is, is being true to myself. So as a biracial black woman, I had always a need for belonging and not knowing my father's mother and my maternal ancestors within my black lineage, it, it has really had an impact on me. So creating images of beautiful black women has always been a foundation in my work and, and really a grounding and at my heart center of, of who I am. It's a threading, it's threading a connection and it's weaving from longing. So these works are both from 2022. Internal Reflections is inspired by the star tarot and associating with the Chinese New Year of the Water Tiger. And Synchronicity with the Deer and the Fawn that says safe, that's what that text is illuminating, um, is evoking a woman's right to choose and the autonomy she has of her or their body. This piece is called Lady Justice and this work is in response to the global detriment of all the police violence. Lady Justice is historically portrayed standing tall, blindfolded, the sword resting at her hip, the point touching the ground. Um, here I created a youthful woman. She is cast off the blindfold in reaction. And the blindfold is cast down by her um, knelt leg there. And it says, I can't breathe. Lady Justice's eyes here are all seeing, not blind to race or creed, rather acknowledging the prejudice within our judicial, judicial systems. And as a way for me to reconcile what was happening within the, the world at the time, during the Black, the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests and COVID all at the same time, I tufted. And they were dangerous times and, and they still somewhat feel like they are. And, and the whole world was feeling it. And there was a, a unison in that. So these textiles are an extension of healing for me. And art has a magical way of healing. My work celebrates my heritage, my Jamaican heritage and uplifts the community. By sharing my art and having my work seen 
within museums and institutions is such a blessing and it's really a powerful shift in these times for young black and brown children to witness a reflection of themselves within those walls. That is change. And there's still so much work to be done, but it's a start. And I'm so grateful for this platform, this voice that my art has granted me and better yet to have textiles, to have textiles hold space in these major institutions. Um, what an incredible feeling. This is a recent body of work that I created called the B Longing series, B in brackets. So I continue to advocate for the statistics of Black art to rise within these institutions for our voices to be heard and for our art to be seen. That in itself is inherently political. My work is, it becomes inherently political and it is, it, it's a fundamental groundwork for change, for equality, for preserving culture and enriching the lives of a diasporic people. So as mentioned earlier, I have a background in theater a Bachelor of Arts in an acting conservatory. So um, it's, it's a skill set that I really hold dear and that I'm quite grateful to have. Um, I still have a love for the stage. I have had a career in acting on stage across Canada and um, also experience off stage with writing, directing and producing plays. And I love to bring a sense of dramaticism within each portraiture I create. Narrative is a huge component for me uh, and to, to have it emote from each textile. So I become invested in each subject, each textile that I'm creating and I weave in within my research, within my thinking, within my play, within creating the narrative, current affairs and music and literature and drawing from my own personal life. And it all becomes pattern or symbology or whether I'm inspired by color within the textiles. This piece is called A Prayer. And again, I created in the height of the protests during the Black Lives Matter movement. And this ancestor, which is shown here, she is seen sitting atop a peace sign and she is hidden protected by that dark foliage and summoning the universe through the mandala that radiates from the center there is an improvisation when i tapped i love to give room for play i don't want to be inundated with um, a plan moving forward to create for the day. I want room for, for things to change, for colorways. Um, I want parts of the story to unfold and reveal itself as I create and for it to have a voice of its own to really become its own entity. So my, my fiance laughs when I, when I complete a section of the textile and he says, it needs time to settle, to marinate. Um, he's, he loves to cook. And so he's like, <laughs> you gotta give it a day to, to marinate. And I don't know if, if you weavers or tapestry makers have noticed this, but when you unify the yarn and the thread, and so when you put together different colors and hues, it really needs time for the vibrancy to, to come together, to nest together and for them to simmer, to unite. And I just thought that that was beautiful because A, it's true, and uh, it really can make a difference the next day when you look at it and, and it has come together. Um, but it's also truly a metaphor for life and for the crossing of paths and peoples and how we mingle and, and sometimes collide. 
and how sometimes I have to take a color way out and, and start again. This work is called Excellence. It is 62 inches round and it was recently acquired by my Canadian government through Global Affairs. And she holds a magnificent legacy now of traveling to Canadian embassies around the world. So this work, I wanted to champion black excellence. And so in pink, uh, if you can note there, uh, behind the figure, the text excellence has been tufted. I am inspired every day by the unwavering grace and dynamism of black sisterhood and Black culture remains a cornerstone in North America, in North American culture. Black women are pioneers in fashion, literature, beauty, culinary, pop culture. And the peacock is such a beautiful bird. But historically, in India, my fiance is of Indian descent. And um, he tells me that the peacock is used as a guard dog there. So they're quite protective birds and very aware. So I wanted to associate this bird with this beautiful, powerful woman. And as a woman creating women, the gaze is imperative to me to challenge and invite the viewer to be seen, to see. And color again is key in my textiles and I love to utilize that frequency that is color, the power that is color and how powerful they are when they're combined and they share an emotion and each color denotes a, sec a separate strength and joy and really evokes a feeling from the viewer depending on their own experiences. It emphasizes the story. One key component within my practice is to draw from historical fables. These are two works from a series of four tapestry that I created inspired by the hunt of the unicorn tapestries. So those are a famous series of works that are from the 15th century that are forever locked to the unicorn and in a tale of capture, torture and kill. At the time, it was considered a heroic tale. It's an allegory for the story of Christ. And the series that I was inspired by um, is located currently at the Met Museum, the Cloisters location in New York. And, you know, I had the pleasure of viewing it in 2022 and it was the craftsmanship it was incredible for anyone out there who has uh, who has seen it, message me, let's talk about it. <laughs> I just love that series. Um, but I did, I took this, this tale and I flipped it on its head, creating my own series where my heroine, Virtue, releases the unicorn and throughout the series captures uh, moments of their journey to freedom. So these works were most recently revealed at Claire Oliver Gallery, where I'm represented in New York this past spring called Unearthing Unicorns. Um, the one with the dawn with the vibrant sky is a part of the collection at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. These are the four queens from my recent exhibition at the Textile Museum of Canada, which uh, closed in early 2023. And much of my practice, I draw from a certain era from the early 1900s, which by looking at this set, some of you may have guessed, Art Nouveau. Specifically, this series derives from Alphonse Mucha's Precious Gemstone series. And, you know, when I study him, he has this magnificent way of capturing women, their femininity, 
their grace, our grace, our femininity, um, and really captures this alluring sensuality. I subject the black body within these art forms that were exclusively white, taking mantras of empowerment, of black power, black dreams, black magic, black love, and uh, taking, taking them forward as Art Nouveau was one of the first forms of advertising. So as you can see here, this, uh, this series on top is by Art Nouveau artist Alphonse Mucha, and my works are the four queens below. I studied their postures, the cyclical patterns, the bold outlines that are often featured in the works by artists from this era. And I mirrored this work, channeling my joy, reclaiming of power by showing Black women in this artistic style and calling this my style, Black Nouveau. So here are the other two textiles from my Unearthing Unicorn series. So these are the three and four of the four. And, um, you know, at this point, these were made at the end of 2022 into early 2023. And I had been building my relationship with these tools um, for only a couple of years now. I guess that would have been entering my fourth year. And um, it's truly a testament when you are dedicated to something, even, even for me to witness my growth with these tools and the level of detail that you can achieve and the refinement that you can get. And uh, this is that, and you can see my lovely studio pal, Dante Potato, that is always there with me, rooting me on and making sure I take breaks and snuggle breaks. Um, each one of these works are approximately 65 inches um, long by 62 inches wide. So I'd like to rewind from 2023 back to 2021. Uh, this work, She Summons, was created uh, in my first year of tufting. And reflecting again on Alphonse Mucha, this is inspired by his piece, Job. Uplifting black women will never tire for me. It is who I am. And so this is Queen Latifah reimagined as Nefertiti with a bejeweled crown, power smoking from her fingertips. And I'd like just to show you here, this was a good example of when my artistic, um, my artistic style shift. So um, how I fashioned the bodies. Initially, I had these vibrant blocks of colors that were made within the bodies and then it changed. So honoring my ancestors was integral in my, my practice. And I, I intentionally shifted the way that I fashioned the bodies from this vibrant color palette to these white contoured lines filled with black sparkling thread. For me, it's to emulate the universe, to show the ancestors being one with the stars, connecting to the stars, and this, this is a shift that I have really held on to, to build my style and to have it recognized as such when, when my work is viewed. This piece is called Legacy of the Stars. So I often receive questions regarding commissions and, and collaborations. And I would be really interested to speak with some of you about this because I'm sure you all have experiences. And it, it really is such a personal decision um, given your practice and how you want your work to evolve, to be inspired by, or what you wanna spend your precious time on because it is our most valuable asset time. And uh, for me, 
at this present moment, it's, it's non-negotiable for commissions. So my intent is really to nurture my practice, my voice, to not be influenced by a brand or a client um, who wants me to create a work that is their vision. So I have said, I have said no to multi-million dollar agencies wanting to collaborate, requesting me to create a piece for them with their branding that's been integrated and woven within the textile. And for me, that does not align with my values currently um, for my work, for uplifting black women and nor it's not how I want my work to be represented at, at this present time. I mean, there, there definitely is a time and a place and perhaps it won't always be a no, um, but the interactions and the requests that I have experienced so far within my emerging experience um, has been no's. So maybe one day. This is an installation shot from the Textile Museum of Canada. This piece was inspired by a poem that I wrote expressing my connection to the universe, weaving my thoughts with the stars and ultimately a call to my ancestors. And it's called Rise Up, Encompass the Galaxy. Here we witness an ancestral phoenix rising from dark matter. She is all passion and grace and fierceness, creating her own chaos. And I, you know, I wish that the photos did my work justice. And um, within the blackness in the bottom, I used uh, acrylic and velvet yarn. And so it illuminates the textures when you see it in person and the sparkles within the body, especially when natural light hits it, it it's quite, um, it's the sparkle is just beautiful. So I hope you're all able to witness my textiles in person someday. Um, the Messenger is a piece that I created when I was going through a really tough time amidst COVID and dealing with a personal loss. And it's a message of love. The swan, a beautiful bird that is highly symbolic of protection and beauty and love. And whether this ancestor is receiving or sending that gift of love is um, however it denotes to the viewer. And uh, again, it was my extension for belonging, for connection, for a sisterhood to come together, to unite and to hold strong. And this work was recently collected um, in my province by the Alberta Foundation of the Arts. And it's quite special for me to, to have a work represented here um, in my home province. So just a little thing is, uh, what do you do when you're creating? Um, when I'm not inspired by the rhythms of music, which I is, is mostly what I do when I tuft, but I do like to listen to audio books. So I just wanted to shout out to some black female authors that I'm very cognizant to be inspired by. First and foremost, Octavia Butler, one of the first black women science fiction novelists beautiful books. Kindred is one of my favorites. Um, legendary activists, Angela Davis, Bell Hooks, contemporary feminist uh, Roxane Gay, beautiful musings of Maya Angelou or Alice Walker, um, incredible timeless storytelling of Toni Morrison, and recently contemporary writers, um, Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give, and Canadian author Charlene Carr, um, Hold My Girl is a new book that came out that um, I just had a, a personal um, attachment to. It was beautiful. So I just want to thank you for taking the time to allow me to share my practice with you. And thank you so much to the American Tapestry Alliance and for having me and John Paul for our budding friendship and really asking me to take part. This has been a really great for me to share this with you. And um, next up, what's next for me, you can maybe see a little snippet behind me, but I am creating a large work 
strictly punch needle, <laughs> which has been quite the journey. I started it this summer and uh, it's been a labor of love, but well worth it. And uh, it will be featured with my representative, Claire Oliver Gallery in Miami Art Week this December. So come say hi, reach out to me beforehand. If any of you happen to be there, I will be there. And um, my Instagram is listed there, Simone Elizabeth Saunders. And if you ever want to get in touch with me, my website, SimoneElizabethSaunders.com. Um, has lots of different areas for you to email me and get in touch via that way as well or to see what I'm up to. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Simone. That was a wonderful presentation. It was great to have the opportunity to uh, sit with your work for a bit longer. We have some time for questions and answers, so uh, I invite all of you attendees to please uh, feel free to use the Q&A function and add in some, uh, some questions. So um, I really uh, overall just appreciate how your work is emerging out of this tradition of um, Black representation, um, representative imagery, uh, but doing so within within the medium of textiles. I mean, do you do you think about the the conversation between um, figuration and painting and figuration in uh, within the field of textiles that you're working in? Yes, I mean, and again, just that that beautiful line of crafting within this medium and having it be a fine art and doing figurative, you know, figurative work and portraiture. And again, using these utilitarian tools that were often dedicated to making pillows and seat covers and uh, little area rugs. And so it is, I mean, there is that legacy of textiles historically being housework and women's work and um, to really, take that in and again like tufting is such a, a spiritual journey for me I have a little altar where I'll light incense and like evoke the ancestors and so for me to have that maternal connection um to my Jamaican lineage is just it, it it's a gift and um yeah there is that never-ending debate of you know figurative work and and where that belongs in painting or put aside the rules you know <laughs> again do it do what you love yeah the rules are the rules are just there so they can break them right exactly uh, <laughs> we have a we do have a question um from marcia levecchia gallon um, so the question is, do you approach sustainability in any form while you create? Sorry, once again, did you say sustainability? Yeah, sustainability in any form while you create. Um, at this moment in my practice, um, especially when I started, I was thinking a lot about accessibility and really nurturing my story and realizing at the time during COVID and really understanding marginalized communities. Um, for me, it was having access to these materials and, and to be working on such a large scale, not to be precious about it, to be doing these tapestries, um, especially four years ago when I was just graduating and uh, using completely wool um, was just not feasible. Um, also for me, using the acrylics, the vibrancy of them and being able to use velvet yarn um, and sparkly thread, um, I have yet to find uh, sustainable materials uh, to use that. Thanks. But thanks for the question. It's always on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Um, our next question comes from Karen LeBlanc. Your work is beautiful and colorful. Have you ever been asked a question about fading, for example? Has anyone asked 
if the pieces will fade in the sun or light over time? If so, what is your response? Thank you. Mm. And again, I think because I predominantly do use acrylic yarn, um, that notion of fading, I believe will happen um, less over time to have that impact. Um, you know, I, I definitely consider the artists that take the time to dye their own wool, to uh, spin their own yarn, and it, it's such a beautiful thing to watch. And I can really understand how, especially dyeing your own yarn to really think about the legacy of that piece and uh, preserving it. Um, but also being an emerging artist and having been in this practice for four years, um, I haven't really considered that as much. And again, I think using acrylic yarns, it's not as much of an issue. Aren't all of us who make art just terrible at considering the question of whether our work is going to be around? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so funny. One of my um, art teachers at the time, one of my fiber teachers, he was like, I asked them a, a question about conservation. And he was like, leave that for them down the road. Leave that for the museum to figure out. <laughs> He's not entirely wrong as artists. We're just so devoted to getting it out there and not always thinking about the longevity of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> We have, another, we have another question here from uh, Katha Todd Hooker. Um, thank you. I'm so impressed with your narratives. I am uh, between, and so is my family, Native American and Black and white. There seems to be so little that cuts across those boundaries. So more of just a, a, a comment and a, of appreciation of thank uh, you. work. Thank you so much. His identity. So thank you. Um, one thing I would, you were, you were talking a little bit in your, uh, in your presentation about, um, improvisation and, uh, a certain way in which you're approaching improvisation. And I'd love to hear you talk more about that. Like the, uh, how does improvisation influence the form? Is there a kind of an, an ethic or a meaning that you're achieving through utilizing the act of improv? And of course, it's informed improvisation. You have a cartoon that you're following. There's an intention. But there is also like a particular um, approach that you're bringing to this work where you're allowing it to emerge through the making, right? Through the response yeah. of material and color. Um, and I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit more. Oh, absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, I um. So initially within my process, I will start with the figure with my ancestor and I will really have locked in the gesture because I, you know, gestures is such a communication, especially when they're frozen, locked in forever in time uh, with whatever they're evoking. And same with the gaze. So I always start with the eyes. And in particular, I mean, as textilers, you know that um, it's a medium that you can't always control. And so when I start with the eyes, I want to make sure that I have that vision. I have that gaze, that connection. And so from there, I do. I have a general gesture of the piece. I have the cartoon. I have the setting. Um, but the room for play that I leave are within my color palette and within my research of, you know, iconography and symbology that will surface. I'm quite enamored with, again, Art Nouveau or Egyptology or within current day affairs and having certain iconographies that, that speak to different things, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement or something that's going on. And so that could surface in a pattern or a symbol um, within the piece or music that I'm listening to that can really bring up a sense of color. And again, it's that affiliation that that cover color really denotes this emotion that that can be so strong. Um, and so that's really what I leave room for if I have something in my mind, a, a color way and and for that to be able to change. 
Thank you. It, you've been talking a lot tonight about um, cosmologies and uh, ancestor worship and altars and um, I'm really struck by the way in which you're you're creating this through line between you know contemporary political urgency and something that is maybe uh, transcendent or beyond um, all of that. Uh, it just the, the, my students hate when I ask questions like this because I'm just like, <laughs> can you talk more about it so we can hear you think? But um, can you talk more about it? So we can hear you think some of the like is there is there a, is there a particular tradition that you're drawing upon or are you really uh doing something perhaps more expansive um that, that, that it's it's just uh something i'm really struck by in the way that you're talking about your work mm -hmm. yes thank you for that i mean i i do dig deep within my jamaican lineage that then stems to africa and really understanding some traditions within that but First and foremost, I think what comes from that is my own personal spirituality and having lost my father um, almost 20 years ago now and having that disconnect um, within my blackness and again, not knowing his mother or, the, or his grandmother and, and really vying for that maternal connection. And so it is, it is deeply spiritual for me and, and I wish that I could... Um, say where I heard this before, um, but it was this um, beautiful woman who, she's Canadian and, and she mentioned um, about your ancestors, it's a relationship. So you have to start talking to them in order for them to start giving to you. Like it's not just this oblivious thing, like you, you have to start that relationship. And so I think within my toughening, it really is something that I have nurtured and, and really carving out this this beautiful safe and sacred space and lighting incense and candles and and honoring them and and inviting them to channel through me and with me to create these stories and it really i feel more connected to them through that well, thank you <laughs> Um, so we have time for one more question, if anyone would like to uh, throw that out there. Otherwise, we can continue talking about the cosmic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm all here for that. <laughs> um, one one thing, since we're, we're having a little down moment, one thing I... I uh, I love the way you spoke about the um, the the tapestries that you produce, the unearthing unicorn tapestries, in their response to the hunt for the unicorns. It is almost like it's this, this aftermath where this figure came and set someone free, set the unicorn free. And I mean, it is such a um, sadistic series of tapestries, despite, despite how beautiful it is. It's this horrible murder, right? Have you seen that? I've seen many. Oh, not okay. not up. No, <laughs> um, but but I I love I love the introduction of empathy and um, uh, liberation that you're bringing to that. Do, do you see it as a, as an alternative narrative? Is it a, a kind of an aftermath where the unicorn is set free and they're going on a journey? And yes, it is. It is definitely that having this unicorn locked throughout centuries and and really tethered to this story of of torture and kill and it's just this magnificent creature and for me because because it was created in this you know biblical time and really has this connection to the allegory of christ um, and i'm much more of a spiritual person and so i wanted to also release the unicorn from that um and to more of this this daydream that the unicorn is and, and the unicorn being representative of our morals and our ultimate values and love. And so there is a liberation of that for a black woman to come and, and liberate these kind of the ultimate, ultimate values and, and morals and ride off into the sunset with, with that, with that love. That's a, that's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you so much. Um, we do have one more question from the audience and this will be our last question. It's a maybe simple uh, 
technical question. So how did you decide on tufting as your medium instead of say tapestry weaving? Hmm. I love tapestry weaving. Um, and again, like I noted, I love jacquard and and it is such a beautiful thing. Instagram is like it's little, really a love hate relationship, but but it's you're able to survey what's out there. And I just remember the first time John Paul seeing your work, and I was just like gobsmacked. It was it was <laughs> and at at the time I was doing the jacquard, and we were doing like the two tone weaves, and even that like making those files was just. It was incredibly difficult. So I have the utmost respect for your tapestries. They're so incredible. Um, so I love weaving. That is always a love for me. But again, when I saw the tufting machine, I mean, I really wanted to try something new at the time and um, something that was not a resource at the university that I was going to. And so the summer I, I, my brother's my twin is a carpenter and he built me my my loom my frame that you see behind me and it's really a, a challenge like this utilitarian tool that looks like a gun that you feed the yarn through and it's you know it's in its upright position and um it's like I, it was just the stance of holding this machine and um it's like painting with thread and so it is, it is some, it's a medium that I have decided to nurture and that I really want to master. And I can't say that I will relinquish completely from weaving because it's, it's definitely a love of mine, but access in my studio right now, I just, I don't have a loom. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much, Simone. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It has been our pleasure to uh, share this conversation with all of you. And thank you again, Simone, for sharing your wonderful work mm -hmm. with tonight. And if you're all going to be in Miami, um, stop by the fairs and check out Simone's work. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I hope you all have a beautiful night. Thank you. Great.